Hello and welcome to episode 75 of Retro Encounter, the RPG fan off topic podcast where we play a new RPG every month and also talk about whatever we feel like. Today is a very special day because we are spending our second Chrono Trigger episode of the month of March. I'm really excited to talk about it again with y'all, and joining me today are Alana Hakes. Hello, everyone. Chris Gebauer. Hey, friends. And Peter Treisenberg. Hi, I'm staring at a picture of Sean Connery's crotch, and I'm really, really confused. <laughs> oh, okay, um, for clarification, <laughs> I, I initiated an unwise discussion of the film Zardoz with these three before. And I cannot, I will never get this image out of my head. And uh, I, I may have, so if you really want to be scarred for life, look up a picture of Sean Connery and Zardoz, but I, I would recommend playing Chrono Trigger instead of watching Zarga, Zardoz ten times out of ten. I'd recommend playing Chrono Trigger over a lot of things, mm. but that's yeah. definitely one of them. Most things. <laughs> and uh, you already know this if you listen to the first episode, but one of the four of us is playing Chrono Trigger for the first time. So I'm going to immediately pick on Chris. Uh, Chris, uh, don't All right. you, you don't tell us everything yet, but um, right. uh, immediate reaction, because I think you finished playing Chrono Trigger literally 30 minutes ago or something. Yeah, uh, I finished. I finished the 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 final battle about an hour ago, hour and a half now, okay. and then went for lunch. <laughs> so yeah, it is it is very fresh. So just the quick quick little take. It's mm-hmm. it's awesome. The game's still amazing. It didn't change since the first half. It's still great. Now I was definitely wrong uh, about uh, some of those. <laughs> I guess predictions for what was going to happen for the second half. Uh, you guys were totally right. Magus is kind of the dude. He's right. hilariously just the most, to me, he is the, I guess the epitome of what, if I had played this when I was 11, I would have thought was the coolest, most dark, mysterious individual ever. Oh yeah. He's a favorite character of Edge Lords, that's for sure. And I, oh, um, yes, but... thank you. That is that is exactly what I, I wanted to say. <laughs> it every it every is Reaper so main like spot. Oh, oh god! Oh, you're right. Do man. we not think that Scythe <laughs> is such an underused weapon in RPGs? Like so few characters use them. Yeah, except except in Dark Souls, which is why you should all play Dark Souls. And even Souls. Yeah. yeah, and right. even so, Magus is largely a magic based character as well. So, yeah. Now, I didn't play with him a ton. I did for some of the side quests at uh, towards the end, just because I wanted to get a sense of how he played. But I definitely stuck to what at that point was already my main trio. And I I think Frog, I got to remember the real the names that they're given, not what I gave them. Uh, Frog, Marl and Chrono really were the core trio I did the whole second half with for the most part. I would always use every party member for their own quest. Uh, I mean, you have to for some of them. But yeah, God, I mean, the game's great. It's so great. And they and technically, there's still questions that aren't answered by this first playthrough, well, which is wonderful. Yeah, we're going to ask a couple of those questions later. Hmm. I wanted to... Uh, I'm going to address two quick plot points. Uh, and just wanted to know, Chris, how much you were expecting them or if you already knew about them. Were you aware right. that Magus was a playable character? Or No. Okay. So I, I had no idea, okay. because wow. you guys were hinting to me the whole time. I was oh, really trying to avoid it. I was trying to avoid really saying cool. it. And I loved it, because you guys were trying so hard to avoid it by <laughs> talking about it so much without saying the name, which uh-huh. was the most hilarious <laughs> I, I, thing last time. I was, sh- I was sure we had given it away, man. I was, I'm I was like sure dying you... of food poisoning, just being like, this is this is the best. Nah, They're so was, excited for me. Like, I, I was sure you just already knew and were just being polite. <laughs> oh, I really had no idea. That's uh, okay. quite I was sure... From the second, and I think I mentioned this to you uh, quickly earlier this week, but I was so positive because I was thinking, oh, seventh character, seventh character, who could it be? Unfortunately, it was just in the back of my head, but I knew it was going to be Janice. I was so convinced it was going to be Janice once I right. met him. And I the, just didn't know how. The, well, uh, it is. <laughs> well, you were right. But I know, it, exactly. Because but that's what was Janice so weird. Is a is child in 12, the reveal was... Not what I expected to be. I knew it was going to be Janice, but when the when he when the prophet you know, throws off the cloak, the cool moment thing happens. Mm-hmm. There's that split second of like, I, this sprite's recognizable, but I don't know why. And then it says Magus because I have Frog in the party. He's like Magus. 
freaks out. So like, what? What? What just happened? Mm-hmm. What just happened? And he, so, and yeah, he, I, I had, and he, and I had my prophet. nerd out freak moment. And he's a prophet in zeal that's able to predict what happens because he experienced he went through those, it all. He ex- exactly, experienced all it. those events as a child. So it's, it's pretty cool. I mean, when you see the scene at the end of the Ocean Palace where uh, Lavos, his powers go a little wild and throw Janus and the three gurus into a time gate and they all get thrown to different places and you realize, oh, I've already met all the gurus. Oh, yep. Janus yeah. grows up to be Magus. Uh, it ties a couple story threads together in a really satisfying, surprising way. I, I, it's yeah. it's, it's great. It's three but... seconds and immediately you're like, okay, now these questions like Melchior that I've been having for a while, get it. It, take, it Legitimately, it's three panels, just three, like you said, or four panels and you're just like, okay, now that'll make sense. Now we move on. It's great. It's, yeah. it's so economical yeah. in storytelling. It's in fantastic. Fact. I like the yeah. way they hint to it the first time you go to Zeal as well, because I think Melchior was standing there, and you go up to him, and he's just like, oh, it's Melchior, and he's like, I, do I know you? And it's like, what's going on the first time you play? You just yeah. completely Walking in and off. seeing Masa and Mune, just, and you're like, wait, I, I okay, so you're here. Yeah. Here. Right, so... That's when I was starting to be like, okay, there's this is this is supposed to be the centerpiece to how everything else is going to unfold. Like right. that was now, the cool thing gonna... about seeing the two of them in zeal immediately. <laughs> I know you're about to say like, we got to slow down, yeah, but yeah, bit. that was, yeah, we're going to remind it a little bit and talk about, do it, do it, do it. and talk about zeal because um, zeal is at least in my opinion, you feel free to disagree. Sort of when Chrono Trigger takes a bit of a turn from a, almost like a, a time travel tourism RPG to a, a sci-fi fantasy RPG with sort of something to say. And, and, uh, and Zeal is where Chrono Trigger becomes more of its own game and less a, you know, jumping around between time periods and more just un- uniting any- everything together to this Lavos conflict. It and, gives it sort of a grand arc. Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's, um, and, and Zeal <laughs> becomes the arc through to the end game, up, right, up until you, you, up, right up until you discover what Lavos is. So, uh, let's talk about Zeal a little bit. Like, it, um, it's... It's it's really strange getting thrown there for the first time because it doesn't look like anything in history. What with its floating continents and its super advanced yep. magic civilization, and and also they throw a bunch of terminology at you at once, like the like what what the hell's the Mammon machine and uh, mm-hmm. and who the hell <laughs> what the who the hell are the Gurus and enlightened ones and Mountain of Woe? What the hell's going on? Um, yeah, I'm gonna let's have an open ended zeal discussion for a few minutes, uh, starting with uh, I guess Peter like. What kind of when you play through Zeal for the first time, or at least uh, when you played it through this time, does it does it feel like a turning point? Does it feel like when it gets serious, or just does it like like what what's your basic opinion on Zeal? Definitely, um, I think I, I agree that the kind of the moment where the story comes to a head, um, it's when they start. It's kind of it's when all the any like mysteries that they've been building up throughout the game. Just regarding the the, ti- the time gates and Lavos itself, and mm-hmm. um, it just it just all kind of comes. It start is all where it starts coming together. You kind of get this little intrigue plot with the Queen and Dalton and um, yeah. all these other characters. Sh- Shala is kind of the linchpin of almost the whole of of of, of the game, and um, it it is it, it it's probably one of my favorite areas. Just in terms of sheer design. It's gorgeous looking. The music is fantastic. It's just, it's it's so engaging. It has some of the coolest dungeons. I haven't I haven't totally nailed it down yet, but I think I am going to use Shala's theme for the intro of this episode. It's so good. It's such a great song. It's a great song. Yeah. You know, it's okay. So I totally agree that Zeal is kind of where the game there's a there there is a break in terms of how you've gone from moment to moment through the story. Yes, like you said, it's a time traveling epic. And while you can still bounce back and forth between gates, the how you progress outside of, I guess, challenging uh, Lavo straight out, to me felt really clean and linear. Like I knew mm-hmm. to an extent always where I had to go. Yeah, Sometimes and, I would and, take and a left turn from, and yeah. be like, maybe I'm going the wrong spot. And yet somehow, and this kind of going back to what we said uh, in the and, first and episode going, of how the game's made. Yeah, you're it's going so well made, points. it just happens. It just it just always funnels you the right direction, even if you feel like you're sometimes discovering something, it was where you were supposed to be. And then Zeal happens. Just exploring the floating continents, 
I was I I knew where I had to go because I was talking to people and I and I had a sense of quick time to go to the palace now. But with something like the Mammon Machine, I kept thinking, you know, like maybe I have to explore the remnants of the planet. Like maybe I have to go back down. And there's going to be something else. And I all of a sudden had all these questions about that time period that they don't really answer until you can kind of explore towards the end. And I loved that. I loved how immediately they were like, here's this giant wrench into the understanding of everything to this point outside of, I mean, eventually Magus, when you, when that reveal happens. And of course the gurus, you've had no mention of this world. I don't think unless I missed some little secret uh, hint at some point earlier in the game. They, they and there is just, one point where they mention it. If you speak to Balthazar in 2300 AD before he gives you the time machine, yeah, he, yeah. Do, he does mention. Uh, I, I don't know if he mentions Zeal or Shala or both, but it, he he it, he mentions it and it does not make any sense to the player. At okay, that point. so that's why if if I read it, it didn't even register because I was like, all right, word that I don't know. Yeah, you are a but, crazy old man. Yeah, whatever, I was like, dude. great. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but. Yeah, it it just it fascinated me. Like I kept trying to figure out if I could activate the Blackbird early or something like that because I I just it was just such a wonderful left turn from everything else that had happened, and I really wanted to figure out what the hell was going on in Zeal. Right, uh, and, and of course, <laughs> and then you have the little thing of like opening up the books, and I'm glad that I I figured that out because whew, oh, so, oh, so you got you got to both of those treasure rooms then. I did get to both rooms, although the first time I did the new room with the six of them, uh, I was just like, I, I, this is, this is going to be a lot of time, and I don't care. <laughs> so I did not finish <laughs> that room, uh, but I did the first one. So I was able to open all the Demon Crest chests and all that stuff. Right. Oh, oh yeah. I'm already, um, quick uh, question. Did you guys grab the, uh, um, the sword or the helmet when you did the, uh, the Medina Village uh, crest? Sword, Sword and very much regret it. Yeah. I didn't do it this time. I can't remember what I picked the first time. Probably the sword. The sword is um, Chrono's second or third best weapon. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it gives a speed bonus, which is rare and awesome. But but the, awesome. Hel- the helmet is one of the best. It's like maybe the best helmet in the game other than a prism, prism helm. Yeah. Or a haste helm. Yeah, but it's, that's uh, why I feel like I should have done the helmet. Yeah, I'm going to second... do it. Second, I got the best weapon. I was like, "Damn it!" Check and I think you can, do, you can do the multiple playthroughs, New Game Plus, and just yeah. get get more. That is true. That is yeah. true. I have Which definitely I do. done that. Um, <laughs> Everyone me in perfect too. Not bad examples. <laughs> plus, I think in um in the DS version, a bunch some of the late game bosses you can steal safe helms and and also from yeah. the, from the Queen Zeal battle at the top of the Black Omen, you can steal a extra Prism helm and Prism dress from her. So there, there's oh. way, yeah, there's ways to get, uh, um, well, multiple copies of what seems super like, high level gear. Yeah, yeah. What, what seems like limited mm-hmm. term gear. I think the only, uh, I'm not, I'm, I think there's only one way to get moon armor, and that's like the only armor piece where that's like that. But other, than, but other than that, it's um, Chrono Trigger's like end game equipment hunt is pretty fun and varied. There's lots of ways to get the different things. Um, Stick and in. I'm sure I, by the way, I'm sure I missed most of that because I really only went through. <laughs> I tried not to use a uh, a wiki for any of that stuff, and so it was really just chests I remembered along the way. But yeah, correct so, me if I'm wrong. Oh, if you if you if you open up some of those chests later on in time, they're better versions of whatever the item yeah, is. Sort of. Yeah, I did not do that. Right. It's super weird. Yeah, for I think it's six chests in the game. If you go to the Middle Ages and examine the chest, and then when it says, do you want to open it, you say no. Then you go to the same chest in 1000 AD, and it gives you an upgraded version of the item that was in the Middle Ages. <laughs> and there's, yeah, uh-huh. there's a couple and, spots of those, and I did not do that, yeah, those there's, variants. There's six of those, and one of them is Marl's best weapon. But yep. it's, uh, I did not. Yeah, there's a lot of weird stuff in the second half of Chrono Trigger that you can pretty easily miss. Like uh, One of my favorite parts of one of the uh, later side quests is... Um, when you're getting the sunstone and you have to have it sit in the, uh, sit in the sun shrine for over yeah. 65 million years, you have to go and find the, the really rude mayor, uh, in 1000 AD <laughs> and, yes. and go to his ancestors in 600 AD and, and, and make mm-hmm. sure that she teaches her kids how to be generous. 
because he's yeah. such by the way do love that little detail of it's you know when you crazy. first meet that mayor of poor and he's just the biggest jerk uh, i wanted to use a lot of other more colorful words but and all of his family's like we hate our dad our dad sucks dad sucks yeah. dad loves money he doesn't love me and then <laughs> you do the quest and you come back and and he's like oh you know take the sunstone and all the kids are like we love you daddy you're the best like, <laughs> i really am the hero of time Make people love their parents. That's the yeah. hardest thing to Crow's do. Crow's a better hero of time than a certain other hero of time. That's for damn sure. He, ac- he actually <laughs> he actually saves people. Yeah, he actually doesn't saves let the cycle people. repeat. I mean. yeah. And he doesn't let a thing like death get him down either. Which reminds me, <laughs> Chris, how yes. how aware were you of Chrono dying in Chrono Trigger? I had no idea. Okay, so oh, yeah. I mean, I think I'm as... also very good. If people tell me spoilers and I know it's something I'm going to get to, my mind is very good at somehow. Just, just letting it <laughs> evaporate. I don't know how I do it. It just happens. So I maybe I knew once upon a time, but I had no idea, and that was cool. And that whole thing with the time with the actual Chrono Trigger, awesome. Yeah, I, I, that part of the game is it, it. It surprised me as a, when I played Chrono Trigger as a child. It um because the game doesn't f- even though it's a game about preventing the apocalypse and you're fighting and then there's a lot of death and tragedy that you see in the background of the game. That that moment when Chrono dies. And then you're stranded back on the uh, the ground part of tw- of 12,000 BC without Chrono. Mm-hmm. It's yep. a bit mm-hmm. of a shock to the system. Oh my God, my one silent rock of a character who has been there the whole time isn't around yeah. anymore. It's, who I poured all those strength capsules into. Yeah, it, it, <laughs> it's a bit of a it's a bit dark. It's a bit of a, a wake up call, or I don't know exactly yeah. what the right term is. It's um. I think. Al- Alana, yeah, no, no, Alana, go ahead. Uh, like, uh, was... how did that make you feel? Yeah, I was gonna say where you say he's the silent rock, the fact that he's a silent protagonist, you don't really ever get the silent protagonist acting outside of your realm of thought. So you're usually the person who you like superimpose yourself onto the silent yeah. protagonist. The and so when, yeah. So when you have to, I can't, I don't know whether it's different for the PS1 version, but on the Super Nintendo version, you have to walk Chrono towards Lavos and like he ma- like manually and then he has to do the spell cast animation for luminaire and um yeah it's just kind of like that moment where you're just like you're joking like you're seriously kidding something's gonna happen he's either gonna destroy lavos and or something else and then when you wake up on the ground with the earthly ones you're just completely shocked because nobody can accept it and you can't accept it because chrono is essentially like the other hero of time and many other silent protagonists that we've had up until 1995 there's no real there was no real like agency you were the character and then this time you've lost the character and now you have to go through with everyone else so it definitely shocked me like it's a really good example of sacrifice and really good example of like major characters dying in the storyline kind of a yeah a really brilliant um Shoot, I forgot. Subver- subversion of the player's expectations. I had a thing. Yeah. That was it. <laughs> yeah, no, but you're, you're, you're both absolutely <laughs> you're right. On. I mean, uh, Cro- uh, Chrono is the like a Dragon Quest hero or like Link. He's a silent protagonist who's meant to be in some ways uh, a representation of the player, which is you know one one advantage of silent protagonists. They have a lot of disadvantages. We don't need to go into that exactly. But to have this um, character representing the agency of the player and then having that character who's also probably your most powerful character for the most part just ripped from your hands is is using gameplay and rpg plot to communicate some uh, real surprise and real shock i I think Mm -hmm. i it it really messed with me the first time that i experienced the death of chrono arc and um and uh death peak isn't exactly you know a fun time and rosy kind of dungeon either well that part is hard that is probably the hardest point of the game, I would think. How many times did you guys fall off the mountain? Oh, shoot. Oh, God. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I probably played, a few times. I played Chrono time. Trigger like 15 times, and I dropped off that mountain at least 15 times. Yeah, I think I, I remember counting it because I was, I was just laughing at <laughs> that narrow, oh. narrow friggin' path. I think it was oh. like seven or eight. It's dreadful, although I didn't do it this time, and I will go into that later. What? <laughs> But, uh, you know, Peter, I think you, you, you spot on nail it. It's a wonderful subversion of your expectations within the genre, especially for every SNES RPG if, if you've played a bunch leading up to when this game came out. I mean, 
such a wonderful, again, out of left field moment. And that hypothetically you could then beat the game without getting him back? Yes. And, and the ending with uh, Death of Chrono is sad as hell. But yeah, yeah but which is so cool. Mm-hmm. I love it's... that that's a thing you can do. This is the <laughs> thing that I did. So, yeah, oh, so you're yeah, Alana, you're like, I, Screw this. I, I, only, I only remember the end... The last part of that ending, where you you chase the Guru of Time through the portal, but could you um give yeah. us a, a brief rundown of that one? Because it's been a long time since I've seen it. Yeah, so you go and kill Larvos as per usual. Um, go through all the things, obviously without Chrono. Actually, that's a really annoying thing. Before I dig into it, I can't remember about the shell battle, but there's the boss phase, isn't there, where he goes through like numerous bosses from the game mm-hmm. up until the Mammal Machine or right. Magus? Uh, no, it's uh, up, not it's Mammal up, Machine, I think it's, it's Magus. Up, I think it's up until Giga Gaia on the Mountain of Woe. That's Whoa. it. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, so there are, there's, there's a boss that you have to use electricity against, and I didn't bring anyone with electricity with me because Robo has an electricity spell, and I killed Magus. So... <laughs> Yeah, that was fun. But it doesn't matter because I was like 65, so it's cool. Um, Anyway, but yeah, yeah so basically you go for the boss fight, everything's normal, and then all five or six of your remaining characters drop back into the end of time with Gaspar, and basically you talk to Gaspar, and the other characters wake up, and you go and talk to them, and Marley's like, oh, we need to go and save Chrono, and they're all like, no, we really have to go back to our own time. So you have to watch each of them walk back to their respective um, sort of light where they go back to their original time zone and then you talk to them again and they say good luck and then Molly and Luca go back to 1000 AD um, the king of Guardia has thrown a fair for Molly because Princess Nadia is safe um, and then Luca's like oh no we need to go back in time and because we have a time machine we still have the epoch and we still have the machines then the other three characters, so Isla, Robo, and Frog, come back to 1000 AD and they find out that Gaspar has the chrono trigger or the time egg. And then Gaspar runs through the portal. The other three characters chase after him. And then Marley runs off just as the King of Guardia is putting up the new bell in hmm. the center of Guardia. And Luca and Marley go off and say, go to find chrono. And it is dreadfully sad, especially when everyone's walking through the portals and just going, look, I, Kino's waiting for me, or I really need to go back and save my people, or and Frog is just like, I must serve the king. But it's, yeah, it just really drums in. Like, it's crazy that you can finish the game without the main protagonist, because so cool. up until, like, up in most Super Nintendo RPGs and prior probably fix the main character into your party. I know a few RPGs after that would make you do that. So it's a really, really clever it's so little cool. twist. It is really good and it's really satisfying as well because Chrono is overpowered. So like he's got the lightning spells and if you've taken the time to level him up, you've got Luminaire as well, which oh, is like I know. It's just so, so game breaking delightful. So great. Um, and it's even it's... overpowered if you continue leveling people up a lot because most of the uh, damage formulas in Chrono Trigger are based on one stat and a, and a level. And yeah. to keep Luminaire strong, they made it a little bit more powerful than Flare or uh, or Dark yeah. Matter because Chrono's magic stat's going to lag behind Luca's and Magus's. But if you max out everyone's magic stat, Luminaire is way stronger than any other magic attack in the game. He's They, they made Chrono crazy powerful. He has high everything on, except for magic, and then you yep. can pump yeah. that out. And if you pump that up, his magic is better than everyone's. It's, and it really it's shows, especially when Death... He's Goku. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Literally, Luminaire is just like him trying to go Super Saiyan. Yeah, I was gonna say, but Spirit no, Super bomb. Yeah. <laughs> I do love, I do love the animation of just levitating and making a lightning nuke. It's great. Mm-hmm. Also, most characters. Yeah, I love the battle have... effects in this game. Yeah, it's yeah, so good. it's so good. Most and, characters. And the sounds are very tr- satisfying too. Like the, that, they that really weird, are. The weird. From, yeah, from yes. Luminaire is yeah. so satisfying. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I stand by what I said in the last episode. I I still think this is one of the most highly polished games I've ever played. Like just, oh, yeah. it, it, just in every facet, and a lot of it is <laughs> like what we're talking about right now: battle animations, sound effect, everything. It's just it's so great. It's so great. It's so great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Lavos' screech is like, oh. especially leading into the final boss. That transition where it just kind of like 
cuts in and everyone's in their battle poses and Lavos yeah. just comes out of his reach. And I'm, I'm sorry, I just, if you have headphones plugged in, the final boss thing, the opening beat that song will oscillate between earbuds and it's just like, yeah. ah! Really? Oh, I should go back and do yeah, that. Yeah, it's really well mixed. Yeah, all the sounds. Like, when you're walking, when you go into the shell the first time, and you can hear the inside of Lavos beating. Yes. Yeah. And, it gets and then harder, when I... That was if you cool. take If you take Isla with um, you, she says, Lavos smells stronger in here, and it just, like, makes my skin crawl a little bit. It's just like, what is Lavos? <laughs> what is this alien thing? Like, why? What is it? Kind of thing. That's so cool. I, I don't remember if they clarify it more in Chrono Cross, but it's it, it's um La- yeah Lavos is stays pretty mysterious through to the end because it's I mean he's clearly some kind of super alien super parasite he clearly has yeah. enough power to decimate the whole world he had an entire civilization worshiping him and is somehow able to exert influence over the minds of people that get really close to him. Because uh, like like when Queen Zeal goes crazy and she becomes Lavos's messenger, it's like, whoa! I didn't think Lavos was capable of this. I thought he was just <laughs> I thought he was an angry space porcupine deep in, under the earth. But yeah, I was by so <laughs> yeah. And, and but then at the at the end, you learn lot that the angry space porcupine part of Lavos is more like his spaceship, and he's under the earth collecting organic and inorganic data of everything that's ever happened on Earth. And then we'll yeah. eventually make the Earth explode and create Lavo spawns and send those out to other planets. But it's it, it's weird putting what, <laughs> what Lavo's event you what, what eventually what you learn Lavo's is in context with the rest of the game because it's like well wh- why didn't is this really the most efficient way to do things to be buried for sixty five <laughs> million years? But that's well, that's one mean... thing that interests me is like because technically. Lavos should have emerged sooner than 1999, right? But things like the Mammon Machine and all other fair, it's individuals all, it's get all in the way. <laughs> because technically the Mammon mm-hmm. Machine is taking power from Lavos. Well, and the implication is that And Lavos... then amplifying it as well, I don't... But, but also I... that brings that the Mammy Machine allows Lavos to reach Queen Zeal and raise the Black Omen. Yeah. And, and, and yeah. the, Bla- the totally. Black Omen, I mean, the Black Omen is the the Ocean Palace. Oh, the, yeah, the Ocean just, Palace. Just raised out Float. of the ground, but wh- why, and, did, why does Lavos feel the need to do that? And also, <laughs> technically, it's still in antiquity in 1200 BC, but it is also, it's it, it's technically also through other it, it, through some weird time gate on its own that it's projecting mm. itself into other eras. No, well, no, no, it, no, it, well, no. It, it rises in twelve thousand BC and then just remains there throughout uh, every era, and you can visit it in any era other than prehistory. And, but uh, when you but when you beat the game, it shows like when the palace is collapsing, and I did it because I did it in one thousand AD. This is the only reason why I thought this mm-hmm. is then when it showed the palace. I guess was it collapsing or when the raising Lavos? It was raising Lavos in. Uh, antiquity specifically that was the map that was being shown i i don't know well I, I think when you're fighting lavos you're sort of in some kind of crazy time pocket but you, you so, but can, that's like, why i was like, i was like, confused like kind of dimensional and, yeah and, and you can go through the black omen multiple times if you go backwards yes, I, in time that. so like cool, and so. Th- th- that's the way to get like three prism dresses or something is to fight it in 2300 then 1000 then 600 but and and also and I also like the details of uh, after the Black Omen ri- rises, you can go and speak to people in 1000 or 600 AD, and they'll be like, "Oh, the Black Omen is so pretty today." I do <laughs> because, that. Because no, they're it, like, "It's <laughs> ominous on the horizon." Yeah, exactly. no, no, they don't even say ominous. They say, "Oh, it's it's just sparkling so beautifully because it's been a part of oh, their life of their lives oh, yeah. forever." I'm thinking of just Melchior staring at it, just being like, <laughs> "Right, it casts a dark shadow," or whatever oh. the hell he says. The implication regarding Lavos is that, like, it's responsible for the evolution of life on Earth to a degree. Yeah. Because it, yeah. you know, it hit the Earth during prehistoric times and set us along this course. And it, it, kind initi- of affected- it initiated the, li- the Ice Age. It may have, um, mm-hmm. like, like hyper, like, jump-started civilization by giving power to Zeal, maybe? Yep. It's, it it's allowed like- for, it's somehow, its presence allowed for the existence and the evolution of magic in certain yes. humanoid beings. And that's always something I found really fascinating about about Lavos, and um, it's something they go into a little bit more detail in in uh, Chrono Cross, but not mm. like 
Not enough to ruin the mystique. I don't, Lavos right. remains a mysterious entity throughout Good. Uh, both games. Because that's okay. one thing I love is it's there's so many things that are vague. And it's good that it's vague. Oh, if you game. like vague, if you like vague things, do I have a game for you? <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, <laughs> stepping we'll away from La- stepping away from Lavos and Chrono Cross a little bit. Um, once you finish with the Zeal segment of the game, finish the Ocean Palace, see the Black Omen rise, then you the next logical plot point is reviving Chrono, which you don't have to do, as Alana explained earlier, but. Once Chrono returns, you hit a bit of a non-linear section of Chrono Trigger, where there's, I want to say, five or six sub-quests that allow you to do a little bit more playing around in the mm-hmm. places you've already visited before uh, jumping into the Black Omen or fighting Lavos directly or what have you. So, of that non-linear section of the game, uh, do any of you have a, a favorite one of those quests, or... Yes. One that you thought was the, the most meaningful or best. Uh, uh, Chris, you go ahead and go first. Uh, I have two favorite quests. Uh, actually, and and because we we just kind of talked about you know reviving Chrono, but we didn't really go into the full details of that, which is fine. But one thing I love talking about that vagueness I just referenced is when they give you the Chrono Trigger and you do the whole thing and it's explained like uh, it's, it might work out, you know, hopes and dreams and keep him in your heart and all the rest of it. So vague, and I love that that they don't try to be like this is how this works. They're like it's, it's magic, just kind of let's hope for the best. And I love that potential of, and I I kept and clearly it seems to not be the case, but I kept thinking if you do things in a different order, will something bad happen, or do you always get Chrono? And I think clearly the answer is you always get Chrono. But I love that they plant that seed of like it might not happen, but you can hope for the best, and hopefully right. you'll get your friend back. Because in my head, knowing everything about this game, I really thought for a while that like maybe I could screw this up. Uh, anyway, I just love that this game keeps... It, the expectation is that something will always be different than the obvious choice. Uh, in terms of favorite quests, though, I love Fiona's quest, mm-hmm. and I yeah. love... Which is one of your characters, and, uh, and I love Frog's quest not just emotionally in terms of the character, but also uh, the whole process of completing the Masamune with that quest felt <laughs> so much more complete than a lot of the other side quests. Yeah, It just had such a grand finale to the quest. Whereas everything else, kind of, a lot of times it just ends. And you're like, alright, now I can do the next one. Which isn't bad, it just, there isn't a payoff in that same way. Whereas Frog's also- quest yeah. and the Fiona quest both have these story and uh, emotional as well as usually loot payoffs. Yeah, and it really hits ma- all the bars, which I love. The Masamune is quite a big plot point as well, Absolutely. isn't it? With the mammal machine, it's so cool. Yeah. And also the Masamune is one of the few things you can't carry over into a new game plus. That's right, that's true. Mm-hmm. So oh, you really? could, yeah, you can't carry it over. So you'll have all your like powerful weapons for everybody. And Frog will sadly have his little iron sword. And you'll have to like rebuy everything for him because the Masamune is split, split in two, so yep. you have to repair it because yeah, it's the whole the quest. Yeah, 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 it, yeah, it counts as a plot item, so it's uh, and and you can't sell it, so it doesn't carry over to a new game plus. Except, so I, I so I yeah, keep it a, make, that would a, be nice. Uh, it, yeah, it makes sense to keep to buy a brave a brave blade or a yeah uh, uh, one of the, uh, is it a demon hit? I forget what the. I forget. Some I can't of the, remember what it's I forget, called. I forget all the names of his late game swords besides the Masamune, but the uh, <laughs> it, it, it's it's not a bad idea to keep one of those in your inventory if you're planning on doing a new game plus. Cool. Um, I really really like Robo's quest because um, yeah, yeah. The, the, I like that. The rewards are excellent, inclu- including a permanent plus three to his speed when he's the slowest character in the game, and uh, and um, sort of just subverting everything you knew about Robo. He was deliberately left there to. Uh, to, to lead humans to Mother Brain so they can be, you know, destroyed Soylent Green style. <laughs> and the best part is that you have a villain named Mother Brain. <laughs> right. You do. Super Nintendo style. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But also, also, that does tie into the sequel. Sorry. I, I'm oh. really excited to talk about Chrono Cross in case you can't <laughs> but yeah, we, we can do another, we, that, That'll have to be for another episode if we can't, we can't go too deep into Chrono Cross, especially since you're the only one that <laughs> remembers the plot. <laughs> <laughs> so there's one bit I want to get into later, but we'll get That's it. fair. I like it's it. fine. Yeah. I um, want to 
expand a little bit on Fiona's quest because that was yeah. going to be my pick for my favorite one, as well as the Sunstone Sun Temple quest, which oh, is oh yeah, oh yeah, the, the, the Sunstone and Rainbow Shell stuff is really great. yeah, yeah, uh, they're really clever because they not only is the time traveling a plot device, it is also a means of like with the treasure chests, you can wait until a certain time period to open them. These quests enable you to use time to get the reward so you have to with the sunstone you have yeah. to put it back in 65 million bc and then go and check on it in this time period and it gets to its best in 23,000 2300 so it's a really cool way of using time and fiona shrine is another example of this because you i believe this starts you have to initiate it or at least it benefits if you talk to someone in zeal and she's looking after a plant or she finds a seed and she says oh what shall i do shall i i've been told to get rid of it and if you tell her to grow it in secret and she'll do it and you'll see it develop i think the first time you see it is when the um when the whole of zeal has been destroyed and she's got like a little sapling next to her mm -hmm. but when you go to i think it's 600 ad um robo is helping he decides to stay and helps to grow this entire forest with fiona or somebody i not yeah. this is literally from my memory because i didn't do any of the side quests this way no, through <laughs> um i killed i killed you, too many you, people you don't, I mean, <laughs> the uh, the sapling stuff in 12,000 bc is cool and you can see her later on the in the uh, earthbound side yeah. with her uh, with her mm -hmm. um growing but that's not important to fiona's quest it's oh, um, okay no it's uh you don't that's not necessary but uh Basically, in the present, for most of the game, there's a big desert in between Truce yes. and Pore. And, and in 600 BC, there's a, uh, a little house in the middle of that desert with a, a little tiny patch of forest surrounding it, wh where a woman named Fiona and her husband Marco live. And when you go there later in the game, Marco's come... After you defeat Magus, you see, you, Marco is there now. He wasn't there before, mm -hmm. because he was fighting in the yeah. war. And uh, in the Faded Hour section, after Chrono's revived... You can help Fiona revive the forest by defeating a sand demon that is that was destroying the forest, and yeah. after you do that, you can, she then tells you, yeah, yeah um, <laughs> she's like, well, I'm gonna need, I'm just gonna take hundreds of years for the forest to revive, and I need some help. So Robo who's volunteers to stay behind, Aww. and uh, she's like, I won't Robo. die, so I can just be yeah. here. And yeah. it's in, in a very amusing uh, section of the game, like if you walk around 680 during that time you see robo you just see him as a tractor <laughs> yeah, yeah, working yeah, the land so cute. plowing and uh th there's sometimes he's a scarecrow in the middle of the desert oh really i didn't yeah. see this yeah uh, uh, and, and then you get to the section where i think this is one of the most uh memorable section parts of the game when you visit in, again in 1000 bc there's a church where fiona's uh, house used to be 80 80 just, yeah, just, oh, yeah just, sorry just yeah 1000 AD. so yep. you go to this church in 1000 ad and you pick up robo again and you spend a night around a campfire with luca fixing up robo and uh, yeah yep they they have a very uh they have a very deep discussion as to exactly why they were all doing this and why the gates appeared where when they did and luca has a chance to go back in time to the one sp spot in her childhood she regrets the most when her mother lost the use of her legs and in a maybe the darkest saddest part of the game other than Chrono's death you have a chance to fix to um put in the right code in this sort of in this flashback to uh fix Luca's mother's legs or not by by stopping a mach the machine in time before uh because Luca's mother's dress gets caught in one of her husband's machines and it destroys her legs. You have a way of preventing that in this flashback. And if you succeed, then if you go to Luca's house in, in the present, um, her mom's walking around and talking about going to walk to the fair and stuff. And if you don't, then she still remains an invalid in her room, unable to move. One thing I, I, uh, that's great about that quest is first time I met Luca's mother, I was so confused why she sounded really depressed that's how i read it the first time uh early on in the game speaking to her i was like why is she in why is she so dour and just clearly just uninterested uh in everything her daughter's doing and then that quest happens and it gives full explanation why she clearly doesn't care much for her husband's and her daughter's machines don't you feel I horrible guess... after the first time you screw it up 
<laughs> yeah, no, I, I screwed oh, it up. The very dude. first time I played it, I screwed it up. Because you, you, yeah. you have to, you know, remember that Lily's mother's note. name is Lara, and a, new, mm -hmm. a note says the code is my, the name of my lovely wife, and you have to press L-A-R-A -A on the console. And I screwed that up the first time I played that 20 years yeah. ago, and it, it messed with me. I was, it, it's a sad part of the game if you mess it up. Yeah, I did not realize it was going to be something you could do so as i was wa i was just kind of watching it unfold like oh we're getting a piece of her history and then i realized oh no that was i could have totally done that <laughs> could have totally fixed it mm. i guess it's comparable to and like the second half of this game is comparable to another great super nintendo rpg final fantasy 6 and i like i didn't know that you could save lara and stop her Oh like, right, yeah. Makes, I, I, so, I, know, I, know, I know the part it's of like FF6. a shadow thing. No, no, no. Well, um, there's, no. There's, there's two parts Although of FF six. Yeah, I, I, so, you're talking about the solitary aisle segment. Yeah, so right. there's the bit with Shadow as well, actually, because I didn't know you could save Shadow. Oh dear, and um, he's dead. Um, <laughs> uh, and yeah, the other bit was with Celeste and her grandfather, and I didn't realize you could save her grandfather. So I was no. <laughs> he, he died and so that's like both actually comparably both games are quite similar in the second half where they just go kind of right here you go here's your world do whatever you want you can go and finish the game with these people or you can say chrono you can go to all these side quests there yeah the the fact that you could i didn't know because i screwed up as well with luca's um mother it was just hot it was awful like especially yep. going back there and so i think i reset it because i remember seeing her walking around so i reset the game the first yeah. time and redid that whole bit because i was just like i can't deal with that yeah, i can't do this right I, I can't deal with that and yeah. then i went and saw her walking around and it was just satisfying the one other thing about that side quest i want to talk about a little bit is that I think if fireside we chat we mentioned it before yeah during the fireside chat there um robo initiates a conversation hey why do you think this is happening the way it's happening because it seems yeah. extremely specific that you know we were thrown to these parts of time and and we're sh and and uh, learned about lavos in this way um and they theorize that there is an entity that's guiding them and opening the time gates in specific times and places and uh and and they and they come up with the conclusion. Well, we don't know who the entity is. And I there's yeah. there, there's two theories that I think make the most sense after thinking. I about have it only for 20, one for tw after thinking about it for twenty years. But let's hear your one first, Chris. Uh, okay. So so Robo just to kind of reiterate. So Robo says, "I've been in these four hundred years of waiting. I've been thinking about this a lot, and it it just doesn't make sense to him. So there has to be this entity. And the idea is, he says that the entity is either." something or someone who is guiding us to these specific spots to help us, you know, learn more about why everything is, or it's the entity is coming with us and reliving these moments in time as well. Uh, so it's either a guide or it's a passenger with you, and you just happen to be the vehicle for which the entity can kind of relive all this stuff or uh -huh. try to piece it together. So to me, I... The only thing as of now, and granted, just finished the game, so I haven't been able to put as much thought into it, I guess, but I think it's Shala, but I'm not sure. Yes, that, that's... I, um, that's they, 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 go, they go into that in Chrono Cross a little bit, too, but... I mean, that like, is the most prevalent and most likely theory. Yeah. yeah, that's the thing, is it makes the most sense to me because yeah, of how she out. vanishes. Yeah, she stays with Lavos during the... when the Ocean Palace collapses yeah. and then rises exactly. out, and uh, she... She probably exists in a spot not like out of time right if, now. If if you play the um the new ending they added to the DS version, you can actually unlock a boss fight with um the Dream Devourer, which is uh Shala. Um oh God, this is kind of a huge spoiler for another game, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, it, 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 uh, it, it, there's no, there's... Shala's role in this is addressed more in uh, in Chrono Cross, and I think also in Radical Dreamers. But the fe but she is a plot... she is this outside of time? Yes. Yeah. In the same way, I'm guessing yeah. that when Chrono and I, uh, you know, we kept saying he dies, but I actually took it, especially because he was saved, that he was just banished from the from whatever realm the game exists in. It's kind of so. Like I imagine Shala is in that same. Uh, tear 
I had to use a sudden life reference tear in the in the fabric of reality. Mm. Right, and that's the, that, the that, other... that's what it makes sense to me that she's somehow in the nether, and you know she saved you all from Lavos by sending you out of the the palace when everything was going down. So I assume that that moment she then can look just like with Magus and the whole Janus reveal. She's just retroactively kind of trying to guide everyone to make it all work out the way it should. That's the most popular and that's the most popular and most likely theory, especially since she has a role in the in the game's sequels. But the other theory that I've seen kicked around before that I kinda like is that the entity is Planet Earth itself, who yeah. who who chose mm-hmm. you know, who uh in, in an effort to save itself, um, set up these uh events in motion. But that I mean that, you know, posits that the planet is a living being. That, well, that's has, not, that has the agency to do this. Not, yeah, kind <laughs> of like not all that uncommon a theme in in Square RPGs. So. <laughs> it's kind of yeah. the, the live stream. Kind of, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, it was down to the live stream by a couple years. And and uh, yeah. and the Holy Materia is in FF7 is the planet protecting itself from, from the Meteo Materia. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. And, there is and one the, more. And the planet may even... Any Mana go... series? Oh, yeah, the I Mana series, one. sure. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The goddess is representative of Earth, sort of, yeah. Yep, and it's it's all reclaiming after the mana fortress was made and the world was doomed yeah. for an FF9 kind of, even in a okay. weirder way. So yeah, maybe this isn't so died. uncommon <laughs> in fantasy RPGs. It happens a no, lot. It does happen a lot. So I can see that. Honest the, honest. What? I, have to, the, I, I can totally see that logic. The only the only thing that's weird to me as a, uh, for that concept is there's nothing that I've seen in the game, and I'm sure there is something somewhere, which is why the theory exists, that says that the planet has that agency. That allows for me to think that the planet is that active in... There is. Now, potentially, like I said, there is stuff, I just haven't seen it. So, yeah. is it is is this something in that final dungeon for that second playthrough, or... No, I, would, I, missed early on? I, I don't think there is. Um, I was just going to say, um, another theory it's it's not it's not it's not as nearly as interesting or plot relevant but right. it is kind of kind of cute um is that it's in it's that is that it's a fourth wall break um and that the player oh the player yeah itself is the entity because the entity right, is yeah. at, is at, what's at, guiding at, them having, oh that's interesting i like that and the, huh. the end the entity is put to rest by having finished the game yeah yeah, um, I've had all the gates closed. Well, the rest of, yeah, mm-hmm. and and yeah, that's not nearly as exciting an answer. But no, it, sure. It, but that it, is a. Be, it kind of works. Yeah, it does. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a cool one. I like that actually a lot. Yeah, it's a. God, it. It's a very cool, and this that's kind of what I was referring to earlier, and how wonderfully vague certain elements of this game are. I love that it's an unanswered question, even if it gets answered with the that extra dungeon a little bit more. I just love. That they kind of just posit that question with one quest that you could choose to do or not, and they just let it sit with you and go, okay, so what is the entity? What could it really be? It's just such a smart design choice. People honestly, love to honestly, over do... detail everything, and I love sometimes not knowing. Honestly, let everyone else I, I have can do without the, all of the extra stuff in the DS version. It's um, most of it. Most of it is bad. They, they, add, they add a side quest in the uh, that can be accessed at the same time as the other Faded Hour stuff, where you jump between the Middle Ages and the Prehistoric Ages and help. Oh, the Golden age. Hammer thing that was so weird. Yeah, no, it's it, yeah, all of that's new. And um, okay, the, okay, the, the Reptite Colony is only new to the three to the DS version, and I don't like oh. basically any of it. <laughs> okay, um, <laughs> interestingly enough, that was going to be a question I was going to ask at the end of the podcast was, <laughs> what is that stuff, and am I missing some more significance than no. it? Just pretty, being something else to do. Yeah, pretty yeah. much the only thing they added to the DS version that I actually like is there's a set of dungeons called the Dimensional vor- Vortices. Yes, those are cool. And um, and the new ending it unlocks, which is which is which I I quite enjoy. But um, most of it, like there's a there's a monster battling mini game that is completely pointless. Mm-hmm. There there is um. Oh yeah, which I I walked into that arena once and was like, what, what do I do here? I don't really care, and then I never went back. <laughs> and you have, and nothing of value was lost, Chris. <laughs> okay, good, good to know. Thank you, Peter. I really do appreciate that pat on the back because God, I walked in there, spoke to the three people or whoever. I was like, mm-hmm. I'm sure this is a cool thing I could do, but I got a game to play, so I'll be back. Yeah, later it's later. not that cool. It's token. It, yeah. It's okay. just, they threw it in there because they needed something. Just something else. Yeah, it's game. like, 
It's like, what's your RPG without a monster arena? Like, really? Let's be I, honest. I could do without monster arenas in most games. Oh, so I, could I. I so played like, FF15 for 90 hours, and I haven't touched the one in there. Oh, same. <laughs> By the way, speaking of, because we were talking about some of the end-level gear, uh, the, having both Frog and Chrono in your party with the uh, Rainbow Sword and the fully upgraded Masamune is just so delightfully overpowered. <laughs> The funny, just thing, makes, the, the funny thing is, I don't think either makes of a the, body feel great. They're not either of the top two attackers in the game. I know, and no. I love it. It's Robo Rainbow Sword is even Chrono's best weapon in the DS version. Yeah. I know, because you can no. get in, in those the dungeons you just mentioned, but I mean, just as like yeah, that yeah. first playthrough. Whew. They each get an additional. They each get an additional ultimate. Oh, so satisfying. Yeah. Um, uh, and, the two yeah, Ro- best Robo- melee characters I'm guessing are Magus and Robo, right? Yeah, oh, no, Robo. Isla and or Robo. Yeah, Isla and Robo. Yeah. Because Robo yeah. with the Crisis Arm, if the last digit of his health is nine, it's the strongest equi- uh, a strongest weapon in the game, even though it doesn't have a high critical hit rate. And uh, the extra item he gets in the DS version brings his attack down to zero, but all of his critical hits deal 9,999 damage. And if you level up, <laughs> if you level up Isla to level 90, I think... Well, if you level her up a lot, around level 70, her uh, item Fist becomes Iron Fist, and at level 90, it becomes Bronze hey. Fist, which nice. I don't know why it's stronger oh. than Iron. I don't know why I know, it's I, I wasn't going to go into that, considering it goes Bronze Age to Iron but Age, it's, but it's um, fine. It's, fine. And, and, it's shinier. Yeah, but her um, her attack power is, is based on a some arcane formula. It's based on her level, and if she has the Bronze Fist, then all of her critical hits deal 9,999 damage. So, so I never this that game high. was built for multiple playthroughs, not just for the sake of yeah. Hey, it'll be more fun, and oh, you yeah. can see more endings. They really did add a lot more content for just subtle stuff of just like no, there's and you'll actually discover more. Are there more triple techs? By there's, the way, for there, okay, there's every ten, character, there's or does ten, every no uh, every trio gets one right? Every trio involving Chrono has one for a total of ten. Yeah, and then right. there's and then there's five hidden ones that don't. So involve the stones. Chrono. Yes, yeah, those are the stones. And do you have to have them equipped? I'm just asking for my next yes. playthrough. Okay, they have to be equipped. The, cool. Uh, just checking, just checking, because I found all those and I was I was trying to figure that out. I was just like, whatever. I've got my the, main. Uh, tr- I, I, gonna... know, I don't remember all of them. The black the black rock, which is called renamed Black Gemstone later, yes. is uh, Magus, Luca, and Marl. For a, a big, a big shadow damage everything, and there's a, the blue, the blue rock is Robo, Luca, and Magus. I don't remember any of the other ones. Oh, I think oh, there's oh, yeah. a, oh, yeah, the, a there's white a... one or something else that's, I think Isla. Isla. No, never mind. No, I've already, I've already, already, already. It was Robo, Robo, Luca, and someone else. I can't remember who the third person. Was. The um, there's a, there's a Robo, this. Frog, Marl one. That's, that's the a, one. Thank that's, you. That's, that's uh, the gold rock, I think. But whatever. There's five of those for a total of fifteen Thank triple techs. And cool. It, it's right. fun messing around with those, but I, I think the accessory st- slot is too valuable to waste on a triple tech that maybe isn't the most efficient way to deal. Agreed. Damage. That's yeah. why I didn't go through with any of yeah. trying to figure that out. As, no. long as, I, as long as I have Falcon hit with Chrono and Isla, I don't even care oh. who the third character is. I don't. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, Cro- yeah. That is a ridiculously that overpowered move, move uh, especially for the final boss. <laughs> especially if you give one of them prison specs, it'll deal fifty percent more damage. Yeah, definitely. Oh, really? I think yep. I had prison specs. I could on Isla and Chrono has the critical hit well the count the counter bracer the equivalent of the counter bracer yeah, the 80% one yeah yeah, yeah that's, the, that's, just, called, it's, that's just, what it's, I had on him too. it's I think it's, it's wrath just, band or frenzy band depending on what something like you're playing. yeah, yeah. And, and it's just and then frog was there with his Masamune in the first playthrough I did and it was just kind of like kind of cruised through the Final in, section, in, a in little the bit. DS version, if you do that stupid Reptite Colony quest, you get um, new <laughs> access- you get new accessories for Isla and Frog, and the the Isla one is a, is the equivalent of the fifty percent counter band with a uh, that also increases your critical hit rate by ten or twenty percent. Oh, good grief! And the uh, and Frog one is the equivalent of the Hero's Medal, which gives him a fifty percent critical hit with rate with the Masamune, and also combines the uh, uh, the Silver Stud, which so half half MP on all of his spells. Oh, jeez. Right. So it's... That, yeah. Yeah, yeah the, um, that Reptite Colony side quest that's DS version only has some good rewards. It does, but, but it's... It eh. is so tedious. I hate yeah, it. I, I, I only did the first part of it and realized on my own, it was like, clearly this was... This isn't important. And uh, so I did the gold hammer part and then just ignored the rest of it. 
depending on I situation, Chrono, all I would do pretty much at the end was Luminaire, Frenzy, and then I had uh, Marl and Frog doing mostly either Heal or, oh, what's the name of that delightfully awesome move? Glacier Freeze. What a great That's move. a good one. <laughs> not Frog Flare? No, no, no. Uh, Luke is not there. It's Marl and Frog. No, no. I know, Marl Frog. I know but Frog yeah. Flare is important. <laughs> Frog I Frog never, is really I funny. never, I'm, sh- I'm sure it's great, and I need to go through because a lot of Frog's moves are kind of goofy, like the Frog Drop. Yeah. But uh, I never really had Luca in my party once I had a fourth character available. She yeah. never played with me. It was really sad. And I, I really like her as a character. I just don't dig her moveset. Yeah. I'm a terrible I get, human. Yeah. I'm a terrible human. <laughs> I, I kept no, the main trio for most of the game. I, I, honestly, I, a, chrono, a chrono solo battle against Lavos is entirely viable once you have Luminaire and the, the, the Wrath band. Yeah, I was seeing, <laughs> I was seeing breakdowns of how to do that. Uh, if When I play this again someday, because I definitely will, because I want to see more of the endings, I'm going to have uh, Robo, who I named Roy, but I'm going to have Roy, and I'm going to have <laughs> Isla, yeah. and someone else. I called him Roy because it was R-Y as the delineation, so I just decided oh. if you were going to name him off <laughs> those letters, oh, yeah. why not do Roy? <laughs> oh, that's the most basic name, Frog. I love it. <laughs> you really should have named him Rick. Because Rick. his theme song is Rick I know Ashley. When, um, never going to see you up. Uh, a few <laughs> years ago when Ryan Davis <laughs> died, uh, Ryan Davis was a uh, was an editor of GiantBomb.com. Mm-hmm. Um, they did a, uh, in the the Summer Games Done Quick speed run right after he died, there was, uh, there was online bidding to uh, what to name each character in the Chrono Trigger speed run. And a bunch of giant bomb guys renamed, uh, pitched in so that they could name Robo Ryan D because that's right. That was Aww. Ryan's favorite character in Chrono Trigger. Aww. Yeah, he's, he's that's a, that's a, that's wonderful because he is yeah. such a charming character. That's why I want to play through a game with mm-hmm. mostly just him and my party because yeah, I want to yeah. know what his dialogue to a lot of those situations are. My favorite party is Chrono, Isla, and Robo, partially because I like the idea of, like, present-day character, prehistoric character, futuristic Future. character yeah. together. Yeah, And And also, cool. just in battles... Pure damage. Uh, yeah, it'll be just Falcon hit all the time with Robo either, <laughs> with Robo either healing or attacking with his super yeah, crisis arm. Yeah, that makes arm. sense. So, yeah, yeah I, I like that party a lot. But you can switch out Robo for Frog without much of a yeah. meaningful change in strategy. Yeah, see, I... I did um, Isla, Chrono, and Frog for that's, the that's exact second, reason, basically. That, yeah, that's my second favorite version of that. You also get the really cheap all heal that costs one MP each, and it's just quite nice to have. You don't necessarily need it. For this playthrough, mm-hmm. the very last ending that I did, I had Luca, Isla, and Frog, because obviously Chrono was dead. And so I just used Frog Flare as a replacement for Luminaire, um, which was sad. <laughs> Because I missed having Falcon hit as well. Falcon but... hit rules. <laughs> I, I know I mentioned it, it last episode, but it's my favorite dual tech in the game. Especially yeah. for that final boss. Actually, thinking about it, how long did it take people to figure out that it was the right bit that you had to kill? So third way through uh, my first play, I, I mentioned this before we recorded, but I technically got two endings because I did die my first time fighting yeah. that form. Because about a third of the way through, I realized, okay, everything else is regenerating except this thing. And that was the second time this was happening. I was like, this clearly is what I have to kill. Uh, Or I have to kill all of them at the same time. So I wasn't totally sure. And then (laughs) I got one hit randomly by one of his moves. And I was like, okay, I'm pretty sure it's focused on that thing. And so the second time through, it was just destroy thing on the left to mitigate healing. And then uh, since Chrono is pretty much countering everything that's happening to him and almost always hitting the more humanoid center figure, all my abilities were focused on that thing on the right. And yeah. once you know that, right. it's not... I didn't think it was too difficult. It doesn't really matter oh, to no. me, because Falcon, hit, Falcon hit hits all of them. So <laughs> it's not a magic attack, and it hits everything, so it'll kill it eventually, pretty I, much. Uh, many years ago, I was doing... Uh, I was doing playing through Chrono Trigger again, because that's just what I did as a child. Uh, I wanted, child. Yeah, I wanted to use the uh, the Black Rock party of Magus, uh, yeah, yeah. Luka, yeah. and Marl to play it to play through, and it was a little slow because I had to use regular attacks to kill the left bit, and um, 
I wasn't at, I wasn't close to max level. I was, you know, at an end game level, but not max level or anything. And the center guy has two sort of ultimate spells. One's called Dreamless and does magic damage, and one's called Grandstone and does physical damage. Grandstone will deal over a thousand damage tomorrow or Luca. Yeah, it's crazy, isn't and, it? And that was a bit of a shock to me. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I, definitely. I have a bit of an aversion to using them for the final battle. I, I stick oh, to wow. the... Because because I don't I don't like you know a, a guaranteed kill to one of my characters. See, there was never for yeah. me, and maybe it's because of equipment or I don't know what. There was never a guaranteed full one shot on any character if they were at full health. But if they were, I may have been under under level. Just but... a little. Yeah. Like if they had I... taken even just a hundred damage, then so then it was usually only Marl that would be flat out one hit. Yeah. Uh, I mean, look, all I'm yeah. saying is I remember Grandstone <laughs> dealing a thousand hey, no, I'm damage with you. to them, and, and I was not okay yeah. with it. Because that's the move that killed me that first time, cause, and I felt so good, because I was like, oh, I got everyone who's like, that. Eh. The worst was, I think someone had 150 HP below max, right, and pretty sure. much everyone didn't die on that. Marl died, mm -hmm. Frog and Chrono were close to death, and then there was a follow-up that killed them both immediately, and I was like, all right, oh, bad geez. luck. But now I know what to do, so it's fine. Yeah, all uh, but, but again, I mean, Chrono Trigger is not that challenging a game. It's even no. even if, no, no, no. even when there are party wipe capabilities, there's lots of ways to come back from it, and and healing items are easy to come by as well. Yeah, but um, and usually yeah, the party wipes come because you just don't know the trick. Like early, like the only other time I had a real game over was early in the game, uh, the boss battle at the end of the bridge in 600 AD. Zombor. Oh, yeah. Thank that you. Does throw you off a because bit. I yeah. didn't know what the trick was. And then once I figured it out, uh, a few turns in, you know, unfortunately that, that play ended in my death. But I was like, alright, now I know what to do. There's one other <sighs> late game boss battle I want to talk about briefly, and that's the uh, Son of Sun boss battle. Where that, oh, that fight sucked. Like, that fight was really hard. <laughs> if you don't know what to do, it's extremely challenging. And yeah. even if you do know what to do, it's still annoying. And uh, like I went in there knowing everything, so I had everyone with like uh, fire heals me equipment on. Yeah. And and just like cycled through them like normal. But uh, Chris, this would have been a surprise oh. to you. Oh, I that 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 was that was infuriating. You get wrecked. Uh, I did. I got I got wrecked. Although what's funny is I didn't get a party wipe because halfway through that battle, once I discovered you have to hit a random thing and figure out which one mm -hmm. is actually going to do damage to the core, and I just I, 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 the... I audibly said "f this," turned it off, and turned it back on. I was like, I'm not even going to wait to see yeah. if I can grind this fight out. For, for the benefit of the listeners, there's a a big eye surrounded by five little flames, and the only way to deal damage to the eye is to attack one of the flames. And it's a random fi flame each time, and he can re-randomize the the flames at will. Through a roulette. And, and if you attack the if you attack the eye or one or the wrong flame, they counterattack with a pretty strong fire move. And he'll also cast strong fire moves at you the entire the entire time. So you have to get lucky to figure out how you're going to hurt the boss, and then it can go. Hey, you did too much damage to me. Reshuffle, figure it out again. Right. And right. every time you mess up, you get punished with damage, unless you have the fire resistant and or change fire to heal armor. Yeah, and there's there's several of those armors, but yes. they're uh, a little tricky to find and didn't matter to me. I already knew where they all were, but if you go into that fight cold and not knowing what to do and not even aware that it's a, a boss fight full of fire damage, you can get wrecked pretty fast. And I, yeah. I, I don't remember exactly if I knew going in. I think maybe one of my friends was backseat gaming and told me how to beat it. <laughs> but uh, but I but I mean I remember like like thinking about this boss battle after the fact. It's I understand why it's hard or or tricky to understand to figure out the gimmick. Yeah, that that one more so than any of the other boss battles. It didn't feel there wasn't the aha moment of oh that's cool. That was the only, and I'm actually glad that you 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 mentioned it. Is that that's that's I think probably the only boss battle that I can think of off the top of my head that made me go, come on, that's not that wasn't great design. That was just kind of like a what else can we do idea. <laughs> I think I think it's an okay idea, but it's it's not communicated oh, well. Is 
So no. Like, and uh, and it can really bite you in the ass if you uh, if you go in there cold, like I said a minute ago. But uh, I think yeah. of it as one of the most memorable boss fights in the game. But I <laughs> totally get the frustration of it. I mean, I, I mean, I definitely remember it because it annoyed me. So yeah, I I can't disagree that it's memorable. But that one to me, it just especially because it's one of the only boss battles on that quest line, and it's really early. It's the beginning of it. That also surprised me in terms of pacing. Because that's the beginning of the Sunstone quest. Mm -hmm. Because it is the Sunstone. And then there isn't another boss that whole quest line. It's just the errands of uh, fixing the jerk mayor of poor. Uh, So yeah, that that, that was also one of the things that weirded, weirded me out about that boss. It was like, okay... When's the second form going to come? Because there's more to this quest. And it, that was it. That was just the one. No, and, it, and it was super frustrating. <laughs> but it let me get my rainbow sword. So it was worth it. Yeah, and to, well, to get the rainbow sword, you have to go through the ruins of the Tyranno lair and have Marl... Uh, I had done recon- that first. ...reconcile with the her dad. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, and, and doing those quests together, together gives you a lot of the best equipment in the game. Because, the I mean, the rainbow sword and the prism specs are... Just great. Are just awesome. Yeah. So, so I'm glad I did it because I'm so happy. I'm so happy I had that shiny sword. So shiny. So rainbow. All right. So we've done. Man, we've talked a lot about Chrono Trigger over these two past two, past two podcasts. Uh, we've hit the end game. We've hit the side quests. We've done talked about zeal. We've talked about some of the overall themes and some theories. Uh, we've been sort of teasing at it the whole episode, but um. Chrono Cross does follow up Chrono Trigger in a meaningful way that fans do not always appreciate. <laughs> and, what? Uh, yeah, and no. uh, and does bring in some, you know, Chrono Trigger stuff into the fold. Like you, you. Uh, so, Peter, you're the uh, you remember Chrono Cross better than I do because I've I honestly, uh, like I I did I did some brushing up on Chrono Cross's plot by reading a summary. Uh, as recently as a few weeks ago, I think, like, in between recording, before recording this episode, and I did not remember large parts of it. So, so let's, yeah, hear, let's hear they're... you pop off a little bit on Chrono Cross as uh, related as it relates to Chrono Trigger. No uh, spoilers. Uh, let me put on my soliloquizing uh, voice for a sec. Um, so, uh, Chrono Cross's theme, uh, thematic connection to Chrono Trigger, I think, is best summarized by its game over screen. Um, which okay. is stuck with me. Um, when you uh, in, get a game over in Chrono Cross, the words are, fate has no forgiveness for those that dare stand against it. And it, the way that sticks with me and how it connects the trigger is there are consequences to meddling with time. Uh, fate is in many ways... It, 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 Chrono Cross kind of takes the fate is immutable, immutable approach. Um, and there is a, literally a character named Fate, but it's also a very strong theme. And I won't get into any more specific details than that, because I know, Alana, you're playing, you're playing it um, on and off. But I will say, there's a moment in Chrono Cross. You're going to get to an area called the Dead Sea. And I won't say anything else about the Dead Sea other than that. <laughs> other than this. I know you like that bit. I remember you bringing it up at some point. Yeah. I love that bit. It's there's so and there's a lot more to, to the, why I like that bit. But um, if you remember in Chrono Trigger, there's the, the bit where you get when you're in the post apocalyptic future, you can race against Johnny, um, and it, it's a su- kind of a super fun mini game. You know, the music's all peppy, and he's kind of a funny character, and you mm-hmm. have to do it at least once in order to get through that area. When you get to the Dead Sea in Chrono Cross, if you're you'll be going down the street, and you will see Johnny's remains scattered across the, the street i don't remember that holy crap oh. <laughs> it's a little background detail but that is the kind of that is that is chrono cross to chrono trigger it is the dark <laughs> si- the dark side of time travel almost interesting yeah. there are more moments like that in, in chrono i guess just... it focuses more on dimensional than it does by time doesn't it as well yeah i can tell yeah across his gimmick is um instead of mo- going between different time periods, you alternate between um, a, a, a parallel universe of the same game. Um, yeah, that makes sense. Which, which gives you, which gives, it still it gives you some alternate routes and some interesting ways to play around with it. I don't think it's quite as interesting as the time travel um, is from a gameplay st- standpoint, 
No, it's that, much, that, it sounds more conceptual and uh, than yeah. it is practical. I think probably that's what people take issue with as well. With crosses, the trigger was kind of simple. It's got the time travel aspect nailed perfectly. Whereas a lot of people see Cross the spiritual successor, which I think it is a sequel, but it's more spiritual, I would say, than direct, even though yeah. Luke is well, in it, I, I believe. Mean, I mean, there's, there's there's characters from, Cron- from Trigger in Cross. Yeah. It's, it's oh, definitely, directly, yeah. It's definitely a sequel. And the, but major, the major plot connections don't really make themselves clear until the mid to end game. Yeah, of course. Um, pretty much from the Dead Sea onward, you're, you're going yeah. to have some pretty obvious... Um, parallels to, to trigger and then at the end when cool. the, it, they straight up are just like by the way here's everything that's happened between the two games and what you need to do next um awesome but, i actually now this is the first time in a very long time i'm, I'm interested in playing the game uh because it, it sounds like at least from a headspace perspective of what they're trying to do whether or not they executed it well it, it sounds it like something a, i would dig it is a fascinating um, experiment. Yeah, I was. I it think sounds like it. Yep. Well, that's what I'm enticed by. I kind of play Xenogears and Chrono Cross is fairly similar in that they're, they're well, they, quite they, they big the on writer. ideas. They have the same writer. They have the, and they same, have the same writer same composer. and composer. Yeah, true. And the two best soundtracks ever. Same composer, and um, they recycle. A, it recycles a plot twist from Xenogears, actually. <laughs> oh, brilliant! What one? Yeah. There's a there's a there's a bit where you're gonna be like, wait, this is really familiar. Oh no! Oh, I want to know. Is it kind of like is it kind of like how Final Fantasy VIII and Persona Two have the same plot twist and the game, <laughs> and the two games came out within a month of each other? <laughs> it's yeah, kind kind of, kind of actually, yeah. <laughs> except except people played one of those two, so it's that's a little... true. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's womp, sad, womp, though. Womp. I want to know they, what they, this they, is they now. Played, they played the lesser of those two, but whatever. Yeah, I, I, I don't disagree, but that's the <laughs> that's the one that they knew. I want to know what the Xenogears plot bit is now, so that I can look forward yeah, to it in Chrono Cross. Cool. Hey. Chrono Cross is a good game. It, it's, it, it's a messy game that is not easy oh, yeah. to explain. No, and like, it was hurt by its design. Why there's a lot of issues? Mm-hmm. But. Yeah, I remember when this came out, t- people telling me that they loved it, and then those same people who said they loved it years later were like no it's terrible uh kind of that inverse wind waker thing i almost, and, uh, I, almost I think the people wanted to love it it was almost like episode one of star wars where they were like <laughs> it's tied to this thing i love so it's clearly got to be good but then after the fact a lot again these are just the perspective of, the, of my friends and people i knew who played it then there was a lot of that mm-hmm. it wasn't good the way i liked that other it wasn't enough like that thing i loved so screw this game. And then about five years ago, I heard people talking about Chrono Cross again and being like, oh, it's really underrated. It's like, okay, where are we? This yeah. has been oscillating. I, I, yeah. was, I was it's, similar, it's to, a, both sides. I was similar to a Wind Waker arc on it. I didn't like okay. it immediately when it came out because it wasn't the Chrono Trigger yeah. it, sequel yeah. I wanted. Mm-hmm. But then, and then I played it and I didn't totally get it. But And so my, I was I felt kind of neutral on it. And then it was... Yeah, I probably complained about it on the Game Facts forums or something because I was an angry, <laughs> I was, I was an angry teenager and oh, you were one who, of those. Yeah, I was an angry teenager who loved Chrono Trigger in the early two thousands. But then, but there was like, a lot of that with PlayStation RPGs. You had that yeah. with like Legend of Mana, where people were like, "What did you do?" And again, I, I'm, I'm, I actually okay, Legend of Mana is a whole nother thing, but it is. No, but it is, I just mean it it's like a total cool. change. It's a total change, <laughs> and a lot of, and a lot of people lot of vilified people it just because it wasn't what they loved right. from before. That's but what I, I mean. But when not I, saying, yeah, but when I went back to Chrono Cross a, a, a few years after trying it, I played through it and I liked it better. And I had to, and you know, and also it helped that I was I was able to talk about it with other people, a lot, some some in person, some online, and about why it was different and not bad, and it was okay that it was different from Chrono Trigger. So <laughs> I, I I didn't like it at first, but came around on it within a few years. It, it, it not, I'm not, and uh, you know, with the with decades of perspective now, it's like, yeah, Chrono Cross is a good game. It's not Chrono Trigger, and that's fine. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, definitely. I think if it's brave, from what I've heard, and if, I can overlook the design choices. So, like, if it's like Nier and Xenogears are kind of the two games that I go, oh, do you know what? Everything else is so good, I can ignore the sloppy design yeah, and, the, game, and the gameplay choices. So, if Chrono Cross is similar, then I think I'm going to like it. I'm nervous like it's 
you know, people, some people still call it like one of the greatest RPGs ever, but yeah. It anyway, Chrono Cross. Ten, it had a perfect 10 on GameSpot, and it was for many years, it was one of only, I think, four perfect 10s that website had ever given out. Yeah, it's got some acclaim behind it, definitely. Like, I tell you what, if we are going to say anything with it, it does carry on from Trigger, definitely. The design, like the look of it, the look and the art style, even though it's a different artist, it looks really, really good. It's really nice looking 2000 PS2, PS1 RPG. It's gorgeous. Alana, I know you love Xenogears. And because of that, and because because you're mature enough to accept that it's not going to be exactly like Chrono Trigger, I think you will like Chrono Cross. I think I like Chrono Cross. I like what it's done so far. I'm literally about four hours in. I've just got to... I don't even know. I, I went into a forest and sat there because I really liked the music there and then saved it and turned the game off. So that's all I've done. It's a good game, but uh, it's not the game we were playing today. Thank you so much, listening audience, for listening to us for two hours to, or two and a half hours or longer discussing Chrono Trigger, my favorite RPG of all time, and a almost universally accepted as a good RPG game. A definite classic. Mm-hmm. Irrelevant of how you feel of it. I think the best way to describe it is probably... I said this on Twitter, actually, before I recorded. Uh, it's probably the only game I would call perfect. Like, it's just... I can't think of anything it does wrong. It's like the benchmark. So, like, if you can do everything that Chrono Trigger did, you're probably going to be okay. You'd probably have an amazing budget too, but yeah, I think you would. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I adore Chrono Trigger, and I'm. It was so much fun talking about it with you guys. Thank you so much for joining me. But we, st- <laughs> we still have some housekeeping to do on Retro Encounter. Next week, uh, we have a special episode where Alana and I talk about dogs for an hour and a half. Yeah, <laughs> we we went on so long. Yeah, we, like I thought that episode two and a half was... hours. <laughs> I thought that episode was going to be 40 minutes and we ended up talking for like two hours. <laughs> I, and, told, uh, yeah. I think I'm going to, I think it's going to cut down to about 90 minutes, but we're, we're I'm not, but yeah. So li- look forward to that. Um, our, Alana and I talking about RPG dogs next week. And uh, in the month of April, we are going to be playing tales of the abyss. The, uh, the Bandai Namco classic RPG. Like yeah. the, probably the most well, regarded tales entry other than Vesperia. So there's the two that sit at the top and this is the one it's that's one most accessible. Most, yeah, one of the most popular Tales games and it's like like a lot of Tales games, there's, you know, anime characters with different hair colors, a lot of made up <laughs> words a lot of made up <laughs> made up words for magic and skills. Guessing um, lack of clothing for certain characters. Oh yeah, yes. The, the main that's character has a really puzzling um, jacket that shows off his abs prominently, and I'm going to talk about that for like eight minutes on the podcast. We're going to have to talk about Reed's outfit then as well. This is going to be an interesting <laughs> two podcasts. Yeah, man, we we can just we can just do a third podcast just about the fashion of Tales of the Abyss. We could do Tales of Midriff, Tales of Eyebrows, and then Tales of oh, like man, we, we, should just, we should just do a whole month of eyebrows because I have some theories. I have some thoughts Gosh. on eyebrows. But Good. anyway, that that'll be that's a that's a month from now. If you, the listener, want to contact us, the best way to do so is via email. Just email retro at rpgfan.com. Comment on the rpgfan.com boards. Visit the RPG Fan Facebook page. Follow RPG Fancom on Twitter. And uh, go on to iTunes or your podcast venue of choice to, and leave us a review. That um, The more reviews means that uh, more access and more exposure for the podcast, and that's great. So, starting with Alana, how can people reach you on social media? <laughs> um, so you can tweet me at, at Alana Hagues or you can send me a PM on the forums or just talk to me on the forums. I'm diving falcons on the boards. So just hit me up. And Peter, how about you? I am I have Fury on the boards and at I have Fury on Twitter. It always makes me laugh. Every time. <laughs> it's great. I am the mustard of your doom. And and just yeah, just seeing the image of Fawful just gives me so many positive memories because Oh, I'm I miss Su- that icon. <laughs> Superstar Saga is a pretty great RPG. Then yeah, we can yeah, have a, we can, I won't I won't close the door on that. We might have an episode on Superstar Saga one day yes! down the line. Not played that by years. No. Oh, it's so- great. I've, I only played it once and I loved it. I would I would totally replay that thing. So Chris, <laughs> social media yeah. and forums for you. At Chris Kubauer on Twitter and Chris Kubauer on the boards. All right. And I am at The Real Monsoon on Twitter, at Evogra for Dogs on Twitter if you want to hear my thoughts on Japanese superheroes. 
and terrible movies and uh, monsoon on the forums. So I think that about does it. Uh, thank you. Good night and good luck, everybody.